Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Uh, it's so great to see uh, all of you locally there at El Shaddai Ministries, as well as everyone live streaming from all over the world. Uh, as you know, this morning, I'm actually in Stockton, California teaching. And so we'll be bringing this teaching today live video feed. But I'm very excited about this tour portion. And as all of you know, uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, the tour portion today is Tetzaveh, which means you shall command. And what are the, uh, they to command be done by the nation of Israel? Well, let's look and see. Let's go to our Torah portion, Exodus chapter 27. We're going to begin with verse 20 and 21 on your notes. It says, and you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure olive oil beaten for the light. Now look at this. To cause the lamp or the menorah to burn always in the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil, which is before the testimony. This is talking about the veil in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And then it says, Aaron and his sons shall order it every evening and morning before the Lord, and it's to be a statute forever to all their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. So I think it's amazing that the menorah had to remain lit. It goes on to say it is to never go out. So we find that in the temple, they would hold services every day of the week. So every day of the week is a great day to come before the Lord and worship the Lord. It just doesn't make every day the Sabbath, but there's nothing wrong with coming together every day of the week. Let's look at Exodus 28, verse one and two. God tells Moses to bring Aaron, your brother and his sons with him, near to you from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Eliezer and Ithamar, Aaron's son. You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. I don't know what stands out to you, but the thing that really stands out to me is Aaron's name is everywhere. It's just Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. Uh, and so it's like, my goodness, what's the deal with uh, Aaron? Well, first off, I want to take a little sidetrack here with you. This last Tuesday, March 3rd, was a very significant day in biblical history. This last Tuesday, March 3rd, was the 7th of Adar. Now, I believe many of you may be aware of this. Some of you may not. But... This last seventh of Adar was Jill's birthday. Yay! <laughs> Happy birthday to Jill. But more than that, from biblical history point of view, it was Moses' birthday. But it also is the very day that he died. Adar 7, this last Tuesday. Okay, but you know what's interesting? In this Torah portion that we're reading today, the very... Torah portion, when Moses dies, Moses' name is never mentioned. This Torah portion is all about his brother, Aaron. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but there are 52 Torah portions because there's 52 weeks in a year. And here, uh, every single year, the Torah portions from the time Moses is born to the time when he dies, Moses' name is mentioned in every single Torah portion, except one, and that is this one. This one is all about Aaron. Now, what's amazing about this, Moses' name, believe it or not, appears over 800 times in the Torah from the time he's born to the time he dies. And yet he's not mentioned at all in this Torah portion, Tetzaveh, which is the 20th Torah portion. And yet in this one, Aaron's name is mentioned 37 times. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. Well, 
one of the amazing things to me, while Moses' name is 800 times, but not in this Torah portion, and 37 times Aaron is mentioned just in this Torah portion, look at Exodus 32, verse 32, which is coming up next week, it's Torah portion, but I want to introduce it to you this week. This is when the sin of the golden calf has taken place. And Moses has gone back up to try to make atonement. And look what he says. He says, yet now, if you will forgive their sin. And then there's this hyphen. Only place in your whole Bible has this hyphen. And it's, it's the idea of Moses is thinking about how great this sin is. And he's thinking there's no way God can forgive this sin. It's just too great. And so he finishes his sentence by saying, and if not, blot me, I pray you, out of the book which you have written. Wow, Moses is saying to blot me out of the book which you have written. Well, you know what's amazing? That Hebrew word I have up on the screen, what I have underlined is sefer, which means book, <laughs> and here Moses is saying, blot me from your book. Well, the mem is from, and the kaf at the end, the final kaf is your. So right here in Hebrew is the word where Moses asked God to blot him from your book. Well, as you just saw from the previous slide, the letter kaf is the 20th, has the value of 20. Take a look at this slide. The first 10 Hebrew letters are numerical, 1 through 10. But then starting with the letter Kof, it goes by 10s. And so 20 is the numerical value of the Kof, and here's the final Kof. So what I think is so interesting is here, this Torah portion, Tetzaveh, is the 20th Torah portion. And Moses says, blot me from the book which you have written. And what do we find in this 20th Torah portion? It so happens Moses' name is blotted out. And it's all about Aaron. Only God could do something like that. Well, let's go on now and look uh, at the shoulder stones. Look at what this says in uh, Exodus 28, 9 through 12. And you shall take two onyx stones and you're to engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of their names are to be on one shoulder stone, six on the remaining shoulder stone. But look at this. Here's what I want you to note. Their names are to be engraved, it says, according to their birth. Okay? Now, it has to be with the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet. You're to engrave <clears throat> the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, they're to be set in settings of gold. And then look at this. He's to put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones of memorial to the sons of Israel. And then it says, and Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. Well, I think this is uh, extremely significant because a memorial is to be like a reminder. Now, if you remember, Yeshua is our high priest. Yeshua is our high priest in heaven. Aaron is the high priest on earth. And if you recall, everything on earth is patterned after what's in the heavenlies. Do you know what that means? That means Yeshua, as our high priest, when he does his service in heaven, literally has the names of the children of Israel on his shoulders that he could bear their sins, bear their burdens. And I find that as amazing that upon Messiah's shoulders, he's carrying the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel on his shoulders. And if you remember when he took the cross, he put that wooden beam that he would die on upon his shoulders. And then also we see the breastplate, which covers his heart. I think it's a, a, amazing that a little does Aaron know at the very moment in time, 
not realizing God is awarding him with the role of the high priesthood. What is Aaron doing? He is allowing the children of Israel to come and influence him and have them make an idol of the golden calf. How often does that happen in our lives where God has these great plans that he wants to do with us and for us and to us, and then we don't acknowledge him and we end up going the wrong path, missing out on an enormous blessing that God had wanted to bestow upon us. Matter of fact, this whole Torah portion is all about Aaron. Moses didn't even mention. And the one time all the glory goes to Aaron, what do we do? We read about he's worshiping a golden calf. In Exodus 28, 15, <clears throat> it says, You're to make a breastplate of judgment, the work of the skillful workman, like the work of the ephod. You're to make it of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet, fine twine linen. You shall make it. Well, the amazing thing to me is this is what I also want you to see as you look at this. This, what you're seeing right now, is the true armor of God. The armor of God is not a Roman uh, soldier costume. No, the armor of God is the garments of the high priest. And the breastplate also named the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. But this time, it's not according to how they were born, but how they journeyed in the wilderness. But also, I want to make the point that over God's heart, is the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So to me, this uh, is a death nail to re the idea of replacement theology, because guess what? In heaven, it's not gonna change. On earth, things may change, but not in heaven. And God has, as his high priest, Yeshua, is covered with the names of the children of Israel over his heart. He bears their names upon his shoulders. Now, if you'll notice in Exodus 28, 21, it says the stones now are to be according to the names of the children of Israel, according to their names. So uh, one of the interesting things, uh, I'm going to show you something that I've, I've never shown before. I've been doing a study on it. Uh, and believe it or not, you have a handout. It might be even in your handouts that you have right now. But when it talks about how they were, uh, the shoulder stones were based on when the children of Israel were born. I want to bring up this timeline and uh, test our thinking. How many of you know we all uh, imagine different things of the Bible, but I like to bring in the facts and look at what actually was happening. How old do you think Jacob was when he married <clears throat> Rachel and Leah, and then he worked. Remember, he worked seven years for Rachel and seven years for Leah <clears throat> and six years for the cattle, a total of 20 years. How old do you think Jacob was when he got married and was working the fields for so hard for 20 years? You're not going to believe this. Here it is. Take a look at this PowerPoint. <clears throat> I call this Isaac's age timeline because I wanted to see uh, what how old Isaac was when Jacob's life was happening, these different events. Well, get a load of this. If you'll notice at the top, it says Isaac's age timeline. Isaac is blank when blank. So if we start at the very beginning, uh, you'll notice uh, on the far left, <clears throat> and I have Bible verses all across the top showing this. We know Isaac is born when? When Abraham is 100, Sarah is 90, and Ishmael is 14 years old. So we're going to kick it off there. Now, if you'll notice the next one, Isaac is 37 years old when Abraham binds him, uh, the Akedah, and he's going to sacrifice Isaac as the Lord uh, requires, and then the ram is caught in the bush. We see he's 37 years old. Then Isaac is 40 years old when he marries Rebekah. You find that in Genesis 25, 20. And then if you go to the next one, in Genesis 25, 26, we find that Isaac is 60 years old when Jacob and Esau are born. He's 75 years old when Abraham dies, because Abraham dies at 175. Well, guess what? <clears throat> when Isaac dies... Jacob and uh, I mean, when Abraham dies, not Isaac, I'm sorry. When Abraham dies, Jacob and Esau are 15 years old. Now watch what happens. 
Isaac is 100 years old when Esau marries a Canaanite at 40 years old. So think about this. Esau is 40 years old when he gets married. Jacob still isn't married. <clears throat> then Isaac is 110 when Shem dies. Jacob and Esau are 50 years old when Shem dies. This is when Esau sold his birthright to Jacob. Now, I think this is incredible. Imagine Jacob and Esau are 50 years old. Esau's already been married for 10 years. Esau has a family, but he could care less about the next generation. He sells it to Jacob, who is single. He's not even married, and yet Jacob sees the value of the birthright because he spent the last 50 years studying in the school of Shem, from Shem. This is just incredible. But they were 50 years old when they sold, uh, when Esau sold the birthright over some porridge. Isaac was 123 when Ishmael dies at 137. <clears throat> Isaac is 137 when he thinks he's going to die. All right, now look at this. <clears throat> Jacob and Esau are now 77 years old when Jacob pulls uh, the prank of wearing Esau's clothing to get the blessing before he runs off. That's how old Jacob was, 77 years old when his mom helps him pull the trick. I used to think, you know, here's mom helping uh, Jacob pull the trick. He must be like 30 or 40 or something. No, he's 77 years old when Rebecca helps him uh, try to hide the fact that he's Esau from Isaac. Well, Isaac thinks he's going to die, but he doesn't die for a long time yet. Look at this. <clears throat> when Isaac's 144, Jacob begins to work seven years and Jacob's 84 four years old. And then Jacob works seven years and marries Rachel. Now Joseph is born and Jacob is 91 years old. So Jacob, when he started working for Laban, he was 77 years old. And then he works till he's 84 for the first wife. And then he works until he's 91 for the second wife. And then he works until he's 97 for the cattle. Do you realize he's 97 years old when he's wrestling the angel as he's crossing the river Jabbok? This was astounding to me to realize Jacob was 97 years old when Joseph was born. Or Joseph is six years old, I mean. So at, at 97, Jacob uh, wrestles an angel. He has little Joseph with him who's six years old. And then what do we find? It's after that on the way back when Benjamin is born. So he's about 100 years old when Benjamin is born. Lastly, Isaac is 168 uh, when Joseph is sold at 17 years old. So Jacob is 108 when Joseph is sold. And then Isaac dies at 180. Jacob and Esau are 110 years old, or 120 years old. And then Joseph is released at 30 years old uh, in Genesis 41. At that time, Jacob is 121. Uh, but it's amazing. But I wanted you guys to have this chart. So when you're reading about Jacob and uh, he's uh, receiving the birthright uh, from Esau and when he's wrestling an angel and working you can see the true age of how old he actually was but let's go on now back to our Torah portion in uh, Exodus 29 19 and 20 it says that he is to take the other ram and Aaron and his sons, this is at the dedication of uh, the temple time and they're anointing Aaron and his sons for the priesthood. And it says that uh, his Aaron and his sons are to lay their hands on the head of the ram. They're to kill the ram and then take part of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron, the tips also of his right ears of his sons, and then on the thumbs of their right hand and then on the big toe of their right foot. I think it's interesting that they're putting the blood on the right ear, the right <clears throat> thumb, and the right foot. Uh, because I think this talks a lot about how are they going to hear, uh, also their works, and then their walk. And then we find in Exodus 29, 38 and 39, what do we find? He says concerning the sacrifices, uh, 
Now this is that which you shall offer on the altar two lambs of the first year day by day continually. So not only does the menorah have to be taken care of twice a day, evening and morning, also the sacrifices two lambs are done continually, it says. One lamb is to be offered in the morning, the other lamb at even. So here they're offering lambs and they're lighting a menorah and it happens every day. As a matter of fact, it goes on to say in Exodus 29, verse 42 through 46, that it's to be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle. He says, this is where I will meet with you to speak there to you. There I will meet with the children of Israel and the tabernacle will be sanctified by my glory. And so I think this is so significant that it's there. Nowhere else it is there. He didn't say he would meet with them in China. He didn't say he'd meet with them in uh, South Africa. He's not going to meet with them in South America. Uh, no, it's right where they were in that particular tabernacle. It doesn't mean God isn't everywhere, but there he was there in a very special place. And it goes on to say, and they shall know that I'm the Lord their God, that I'm the one who brought them out of the land of Egypt. Why? So that I can dwell among them because I'm the Lord their God. Israel thought that God brought them out to kill them. And God says, no, I brought you out so I can dwell with you because I can't dwell with you in Egypt. It's not holy. God wanted to dwell with them, but they had to dwell with God on his terms, not on their terms. Look, look at Exodus 30, verse 7 and 8. Not only the menorah, okay, not only the sacrifices, but look at this. Aaron is to burn sweet incense every single morning when he prepares the lamps. He's to burn incense on it, and when Aaron lights the lamps, at even, he's also to burn incense as a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. So again, a continual burnt offering, a perpetual incense offering. Okay, the menorah was always to stay lit. Well, we know when it comes to the incense, incense is likened to our prayers or our prayers are likened to incense. So this also tells us that our prayer life should not be some random thing, but every morning and evening we should set aside, even if it's a few minutes time to pray and to talk to God and to acknowledge his presence in this temple. I think that's so uh, important. We need to recognize God's authority over us. Okay. Exodus 30. Let's look at verse 10. I'm going to have to move along here. <clears throat> it says, Aaron is to make atonement on its horns once a year. With the blood of the sin offering of atonement, he's to make atonement. Wow, that's interesting. It's most holy to the Lord. So on that prayer of incense altar, uh, this is where he's also to make atonement on it. Now look at verse 11 through 16. I found this interesting. It says, when the Lord... Uh, the Lord tells Moses, when you take a census of Israel, everyone shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them so that no plague comes upon them when you number them. Uh, each one is supposed to take a half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. God did not want them counting people, so they would count a half a shekel. He says, the rich will not give any more and the poor shall not give any less. Uh, and he says, when you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives. Now look at this. You shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and give it for the service of the tent of meeting. So in one sense, everyone every year had to give a half a shekel toward the maintenance of the tabernacle. Well, get a load of this. I have here a picture of Capernaum right on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, in the, to the right in white uh, is an ancient synagogue sitting on top of the very synagogue that Yeshua was in. And uh, you see Peter's house. That's not his house right in front of it. That's just a covering over uh, the findings of his house. But you can see how, host, how close his house was to the Sea of Galilee. But if you remember... <clears throat> in Matthew 17, 24, 
Here they're coming to Capernaum. And those that received the half of a shekel came to Peter and said, does your Peter, uh, Peter, does your teacher pay the half shekel? And he says, of course, you know. And so this is where God told Peter or Yeshua told Peter, go throw a fish hook out into the sea and bring up a fish and it'll have a shekel in it. And we can uh, pay for the maintenance of the temple. Well, anyway, now we understand that story better by connecting it back to our Torah portion. Uh, and we see that also this happened in the month of Adar. That's when this event happened, which is uh, the month that we're in right now. Now, we're going to wrap this up with the Hof Torah, and it's all about Purim. Now, Purim is this coming Monday night. Don't forget, at our offices, Monday night, 7 o'clock. But let's take a quick look at this. Uh, in 1 Samuel 15, 2 through 3, uh, God tells Samuel, okay, it's time to go strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and don't spare them. And then in 1 Samuel 15, 8 and 9, what is Saul do, he takes Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. He took him alive, Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And so in verse 10 and 11 of 1 Samuel 15, the word of the Lord comes to Samuel, <clears throat> and he's all upset. And he says, I regret that I made Saul king <clears throat> because he's turned from following me. And Samuel was angry. And it says literally that Samuel cried all night long <clears throat> because of Saul's disobedience. And in verse 13 and 14, Saul comes to Samuel, comes to Saul, and Saul says, why, you are blessed of the Lord. I have performed all the commandments of the Lord. And what's interesting is here he's saying he obeyed, and to obey is to hear and obey. Well, look at this. Samuel says, well, what does this bleeding of the sheep mean in my ears? If, if you saying you shema heard and obeyed, well, if you're saying you obeyed, how come I still hear the sheep that you were supposed to slaughter and the cattle bleeding and lowing in my ears? And uh, <clears throat> listen to what Saul said. He's supposed to be the king. He goes, well, it's them. It's the children of Israel. They brought them from the Amalekites. The people spared the best of the sheep, but it's only to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Notice he doesn't say the Lord our God. He says to the Lord your God. Saul didn't even claim that the Lord is his God, and he totally disobeyed, uh, sparing the best. And so look at verse 15. Saul says, they're the ones that brought them, and we destroyed the rest. And let's go to verse 19 through 21. Samuel says, well, then how come you didn't obey the voice of the Lord, but took the spoils? You did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then Saul's whining and he says, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone the way which the Lord sent me. And I brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and utterly destroyed all the Amalekites. It's the people who took the spoil, the sheep and the cattle. So here he's blaming the people. He's not taking any responsibility at all. And then look at verse 24 and 25. <clears throat> Saul finally realizes he's blown it, and he says to Samuel, okay, I've sinned. Well, this Hebrew word for sin means, okay, I just missed the mark. I, it wasn't a bad sin. It was just a slip. He says, I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because why? I feared the people. You do not want a leader who fears the people. And he obeyed their voice. And so he says, okay, please pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. He's all worried about public opinion. He's worried about the people think. Now he wants Samuel to come with him as he worships the Lord. So he looks righteous, ah, rotten to the core. Look at verse 26 through 29. Samuel tells Saul, I'm not going to return with you for you've rejected the word of the Lord. So the Lord has rejected you from being king. And Samuel goes in turn and Saul grabs his robe and part of it, it says it tore and then Samuel says to Saul, the Lord has now torn the kingdom of Israel from you and given it to a neighbor of yours who's better than you. And then look at verse 30. Saul goes, okay, I've sinned. Please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. Look at that. He could care less about God's honor. He's only concerned with his honor before the people. That is just mind blowing. And then in Deuteronomy 25, <clears throat> God reminds Israel, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt when he attacked you 
when you were faint and weary and cut you off all those that were lagging behind you and how Amalek did not fear God. He says, therefore, when you get back in the promised land uh, or when you uh, have established everything it's, and you have a king like uh, you want to have, it's time to destroy Amalek and don't forget it. Here the time came and what happens? They didn't do what they were told to do. Now, I think it's fascinating in 1 Samuel 9, here there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish. And guess what? He had a son whose name was Saul. So here we see Saul's dad was a man named Kish. Now look what happens 400 years later in the book of Esther. There was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. And guess what? He was the son of Yer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Mordecai is a direct descendant of Saul. And in Esther 3.10, we find Haman is a direct descendant of Agag. And so history repeats itself. Saul was to destroy Agag and the Amalekites because God knew 400 years later, if he didn't, Saul's direct descendant, Mordecai, is going to be facing Agag's direct descendant, Haman, who wants to wipe the Jews off the face of the earth. Very significant. So with that said, realize we want to come together Monday night for the big Purim party, but we have to obey God 100%. So let's stand and let's uh, pray and just ask the Lord that he would give us a heart to obey. Amen. Father, we just thank you so much for this time that we can come and study your word. We thank you so much for the festival of Purim coming every year, reminding us of this story of how we can't fear the people. We can't have a religion of public opinion and we're always worried what everybody thinks about us. But we need to worry about what you think about us. We need to have the fear of heaven and the fear of God in each one of our hearts. God, I pray you would give each one of us a pure, undefiled heart, motivated only to honor you, to magnify your Torah. So, Father, I just want to thank you right now for all of those around the whole world that are live streaming right now from all the nations. And I want to thank you for all of those who are right here in this location right now. Father, I pray you would touch hearts, touch all of their hearts, that they would just fall in love with you and want to obey you from their heart. And we thank you for all the finances that come in from all over the world and locally, Father, and helping us be your light, your menorah, to the nations. You said to keep the light burning. So I thank you for all of those who are invested in this ministry to take your light on a daily basis to all over the world where we can broadcast it. We thank you for it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord, our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah, Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. All right. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm so glad to have all of you here locally, as well as all of you live streaming from all over the world. I'm very excited about today's lesson on the book of Revelation. We're decoding the book of Revelation. And if you remember last week, uh, we closed off with uh, the beginning, the first few verses of Revelation 14, the sealing of the 144,000. And we saw that uh, their mouths, there was no guile. They had pure mouths. And we talked about last week how important it is to be so careful in these last days in regard to our speech. So now Revelation 14 picks up again. We're going to start in verse 6 with several angelic messages. So let's listen to what these angelic messages messages are. We're going to start with verse 6. Here John says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the earth. Imagine that. There's going to be an angel flying around the earth preaching in the midst of heaven. And it says he'll be preaching to those that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue and people, 
Wow, the everlasting gospel. What is he going to be preaching? And imagine everyone in every language is going to hear it in their own language. I don't know if he's going to be speaking every language or if he's going to speak in a heavenly language and everyone will understand it in their own. But look at what he's saying. He is yelling out, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. And then he says this, worship him that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And then it says, there follows another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the other nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Well, it's fascinating about this here. People aren't worshiping the God who made heaven and earth. They're worshiping heaven and earth. We know from Psalms 33, 6, that by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and by the breath of his mouth, all of its hosts. We have a star breathing God. Can you imagine? Oh, my goodness. When you look at a piece of art, you see how beautiful it is. Well, my goodness, who gets more of the glory, the art or the artist? Well, we need to realize God is the greatest creator, artist of all time. And instead of people worshiping the creator, they worship what is created, especially those things that are created by their own hands. It talks about Babylon has fallen. When do we first hear of Babylon? Well, if you remember in Genesis, it talks about the Tower of Babel, which was in Babylon, when all the languages of all the nations were confused. And now we have an angel speaking to all the nations. And what I find fascinating is from Romans chapter 1. Listen to verse 18 through 27 in regard to the book of Revelation here. Here it says the nations are going to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Well, how about the wrath of God? Listen to this. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, all unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness, what do they do? They suppress the truth. How you know people don't want to hear the truth? They want to hear fake news. And the truth tries to come out. I don't want to hear it. It says, what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it. His invisible attributes, it says, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In the things that have been made. I tell you what, when I go out and look at the stars and the planets uh, and all the, the trees and the mountains, how can anyone say there wasn't a creator? That is just beyond me. We, we see creation. We know someone had to create it. When you see a car, you don't assume that time and chance and matter put those things together. How much more for the universe? It says, so people are going to be without excuse. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. They never even gave thanks for everything, this beautiful place he gave us. They became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts became darkened. They claimed to be wise, but they became fools. And look at this. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds and animals and creeping things. Here we have this phenomenal universe that God created that we can look at and explore and wonder about who created all this. But instead of being impressed with creation, what do we do? We worship all these stupid idols that man has created. He says, they exchanged the glory of the mortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creepy crawlers. It says, therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their own bodies among themselves. And look at this. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. 
And it says, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. The men likewise gave up a natural relation with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with other men, receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, speaking of God creating the heavens and the earth and how we should wor worship him. Look at Nehemiah. This is chapter 9, verse 6. You are the Lord, you alone. There is no other. And he says, you are the one who made heaven and the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the sea and all that is in them. You preserve all of them. All the host of heaven worships you. I mean, this is incredible. Not only did God create the heavens and the earth, God continually sustains the heaven and the earth. If God were ever to withdraw his hand, we would be done for. The very fact that God still sustains the heaven and the earth in spite of all the rebellion here is amazing to me. But I think it's fascinating that all the host of heaven, it says, worships God. Wow. Matter of fact, Jeremiah. 51. If you remember, history always repeats itself. Look at verse 6 through 8. Just like it says in Revelation, we're going to see in Jeremiah 51, he says, flee from the midst of Babylon. Let everyone save his life. Don't be cut off when she's punished. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. The repayment he is rendering to her. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand, making all the earth drunk, the nations drunk of her wine. Therefore, the nations went mad. Suddenly, Babylon has fallen and has been broken. I tell you right now, the nations of the world are going mad. Uh, you look at what's going on. They, uh, there's total craziness is going on. And when he says it's the time of the Lord's vengeance, if you remember when Yeshua came the first time, and he was reading Isaiah and he said, it's the time for opening of the prison doors. But he stops just mid sentence. It also says and declaring the day of vengeance. But 2000 years ago wasn't that time. Now is that time. Matter of fact, look at Isaiah. This is chapter 21 and verse nine. Behold, here comes riders, horsemen in pairs. And he answers, listen to this, fallen, fallen is Babylon and all the carved images of her gods he shattered to the ground. So here, just like Babylon has fallen in Revelation, we're seeing the precursor in the book of Isaiah who saw what was coming and saw Babylon's fall. Now, the amazing thing about this Babylon, a lot of Christians argue over who is Babylon? What is Babylon? Is Babylon a political system? Is Babylon a religious system? Is Babylon a city? Is New York Babylon? Is Rome Babylon? Uh, or, or they might say, no, Babylon is a, uh, a religion. So Catholicism is Babylon. Well, what you have to remember from Hebrew thought, there are levels of interpretation. Uh, there's the plain meaning of the text. There's hint at other meanings. There's allegories. And then there's also the hidden meaning. So we have to realize rather than fighting back and forth over who is Babylon, what is Babylon, realize there's a lot of different ways you can look at Babylon. But the main thing is, uh, you know, in one sense to flee, I believe it's referring to uh, more specifically a global world mindset rather than a mindset on the Lord. And so now we have a third angel. Let's look at Revelation. This is chapter 14. Now we're going to go to 9 through 12. And we have a third angel is following them, the first and the second one. And he's saying with a loud voice, if anybody worships the beast and his image and receives the mark in his forehead, 
or in his hand, the same is going to drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. So there's this cup of Babylon full of God's wrath that's being poured out upon all the nations. But it looks to me like God's wrath here is specifically being poured on those who accept the mark of the beast and worship the beast, not those who don't. I can't help but think of uh, Israel during the Exodus. While all the plagues were happening to the Egyptians, nothing was happening to Israel, but they were still there. But look at this. Those that worship the beast and his image, it says they're going to be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Then it says the smoke of their torment is going to ascend up forever and ever. They'll have no rest day or night. Whoever worships the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. And then it says this. And here is the patience of the saint or the saints. Listen, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. There are many people who keep the commandments of God, but they don't have the faith of Yeshua. And there are many who have the faith of Yeshua and don't keep the commandments of God. We want to do both. We want to keep the commandments of God because that's in our heart. And we want to have the testimony of Yeshua. Here it's talking about this cup of his indignation that's being poured out, this wrath upon the earth. Well, I couldn't help but think of Psalms 75 and verse 8. In the hand of the Lord, it says, there is a cup with foaming wine. It's well mixed and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth will drain it down to the dregs. God has this mixture of this wine that he is going to make all the nations mad and drunken as he pours out his wrath on them. As a matter of fact, God speaks to Jeremiah about this time. Listen to Jeremiah. This is chapter 25, and we're going to look at verses 15 through 17. Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Jeremiah, take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath. Make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. So you see this pattern is repeated over and over and over. Isaiah talks of it. Jeremiah talks of it. John in Revelation talks of it. How God is going to be pouring out his wrath from this cup to all the nations. All the nations. And then God says this. These nations, they're going to drink of it. They're going to start staggering. And they're going to be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. <clears throat> Jeremiah says, So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me to drink it. Now, let's go back to Isaiah for a minute. 150 or so years earlier. Chapter 66. This is verse 22 through 24. It says, for as the new heavens and the new earth that I'll make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so your offspring and your name will remain. From new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh is going to come to worship before me, says the Lord. And then look at this. And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. Where their worm will not die, their fire will not be quenched, and they'll be in horror, abhorrence to all flesh. Can you imagine this? After the new heavens and the new earth, listen to this. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I will make remain before me. Okay, so we're talking after the millennium. There's the new heaven. There's a new earth. And God says, from every new moon to new moon and every Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh is going to come and worship before me. 
Okay, so that means, guess what? We're going to be keeping the new moon for eternity, even after the new heavens and the new earth. Not only that, we're going to be keeping the Sabbath for eternity. But what this means is, every week, once a week, and on every month at the new moon, all flesh is going to come and worship before God, and then He's going to give everyone an open vision of hell. Wow! Wow! This is going to be amazing. Talk about a motivating factor uh, not to rebel after the new heavens and the new earth. Remember, we still will have free will. God does not want to have ever happen again what happened with Satan, with what happened uh, on this earth for the last 6,000 years. So God is going to use as a motivating thing after the new heavens and the new earth as a way to make sure rebellion does never happen again. <laughs> once a month on every new moon and every week, everyone's going to come and worship before the Lord and we're going to be looking into the flames of hell. That is shocking. Well, let's go to Revelation 14, verse 13 through 17. John says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write this down, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yea, says the Spirit, that they may finally rest from their labors and their works are going to follow them. John says, I looked and behold, there was a white cloud. And upon the white cloud was one sitting like the Son of Man. And he had on his head a golden crown. And he had in his hand a sharp sickle. All right. And it says, and here comes another angel coming out of the temple. He's crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Thrust in your sickle and reap for the time is come for you to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. And then another angel comes out of the temple, which is in heaven. And he also has a sharp sickle. Now, there's something I'm going to point out here in just a minute, but I want you to follow this. Remember, let's go back to a minute to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. He also had these night visions, and he also sees the same thing that John sees with on the clouds of heaven. There comes one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. This is what John saw. Same thing. Matter of fact, in Jeremiah 51, verse 33, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, The daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor at the time when it is trodden, yet a little while, and the time of her harvest will come. I, I can't help but think, uh, when you think about this, Passover is the barley harvest. Pentecost, or Shavuot, is the wheat harvest. All right? And the Lord fulfilled Passover at Passover with the barley harvest and he fulfilled Pentecost or Shavuot on Shavuot with the wheat harvest. And that's why there were thousands and thousands being saved in the harvest. But now in these last days, just like the spring feasts were fulfilled in the spring and in the summer, guess what, everybody? The fall feast will be fulfilled in the fall because that's the next harvest. Israel were farmers, and so God always speaks to the harvest and the end of the world in agricultural terms. And listen to this. Oh, and also, when you think about uh, Babylon is like a threshing floor at the time of harvest, I also can't help but think of the parable in the Gospels where the Yeshua was talking about the wheat and the tares. Harvest time comes to both. But if you remember, he told uh, the angel, don't go, you know, harvesting yet. Let the tares grow with the wheat. And then what happens when time of harvest comes, because you don't want to harvest when the crop's immature, you have to wait till it's mature, which is God is waiting for the church to grow up to mature so he can put in the sickle and do the harvesting. But wheat, the big difference between the wheat and the tare, the wheat produces fruit. And when the wheat is mature, it bows because of the fruit. The tear is full of pride, produces no fruit, totally perpendicular. And it's easier to do a harvest where you can separate the wheat 
from the tares. And so look at Revelation 14. This is verse 18 through 20. And another angel now comes out from the altar. And this is one had power over fire. And he cries with a loud cry to the one who has the sharp sickle. And he said, thrust in your sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. You know what that's telling you? Again, the grape harvest is in the fall. That's why Revelation doesn't talk about wheat. It doesn't talk about barley. It talks about grape because these events will happen in the fall. This is why you have to be on God's calendar. This is why you have to understand the Moedim or the Feast of the Lord. Uh, for the most part, uh, we, we know that uh, we have hindsight. We can see he fulfilled Passover at Passover, Pentecost at Pentecost. But because the church doesn't know the fall feast, they don't realize they will happen not only in that season, but on the very day of the Feast of Trumpets, it will be fulfilled. On the very day of Yom Kippur, it will be fulfilled. On the very day of Tabernacles or Sukkot, that holiday will be fulfilled. And unless the church gets on the biblical calendar, they're not going to understand these things. But right here, it plainly is telling us the season, which is the fall, when all these things in Revelation are going to really be taking place. <clears throat> now look at this. So the angel thrusts his sickle into the earth, gathers the vine of the earth, casts it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden without the city. And look at this. The blood comes out of the wine press, even to the horse's bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. OK, look at this horse's bridle horse is taller than I am. You know, the bridles, it's going to be up there. So it's that deep. But do you know how far 1,600 and furlongs is? Anybody want to make a guess? It's 184 miles. We are talking from a Washington point of view. You can look at your own city and, and draw a map. But from Seattle all the way to Moses Lake, is only 177 miles. That is how far the blood is going to be. If you want to go uh, south, <clears throat> if you want to go south, it's like almost to Portland. From Seattle to Portland is about 180 miles. Uh, to me, this is absolutely incredible. That's how deep and how far the blood is going to be. 184 miles. Wow. Wow, I mean, that's, that's like the whole length of Israel. Look at Isaiah 63. Let's go to verse 1 through 6. Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Botsrah? He who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. And then it says, it is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save, and then the question comes, well, why is your apparel so red and your garments like one who has been treading in the wine press? Wow, that's what we just got done reading in Revelation. And he says, I've trodden the wine press alone and from the nations. No one was with me. I trod them in my anger. I trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood is spattered on my garments and stained all of my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart. My year of redemption has come. And I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples or the nations in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. Wow. This is incredible. But do you see how Isaiah, Jeremiah, Revelation, they all tie together. They all tie together. This is why we have to connect the dots on these things. Then what do we find? Revelation chapter 15, verse 1. Then he sees another sign in heaven. It was great. It was amazing. Seven angels are there with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them... 
The wrath of God is finished. Thank God. Well, take a look at this. We're going to jump back to 2 Chronicles. This is chapter 36, 11 through 16. Amazing verses. Zedekiah was king, and he's only 21 years old. Can you imagine a 21-year-old king? That's just a kid. How many of you know teenagers are pretty rebellious? Here he is, just past the teenage years. He's only 21. When he began to reign, that's when he started reigning, was 21 years old. He reigns 11 years. So he reigns until he's 32 years old. And it says he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He never humbled himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. Not only that, not only did he rebel against God, it says here he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. It says he stiffened his neck, he hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. You got to remember, his dad was King Josiah. This is incredible. Not only that, listen to this. All the officers of the priests and the people, likewise, were exceedingly unfaithful. Not a little bit. They were exceedingly unfaithful. The priests, for heaven's sake. And they followed, it says, all the abominations of the other nations. They even polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their fathers, had sent persistently to them by his messengers. So God is always sending his prophets, the messengers, telling them to quit, to turn back to him, to repent. But look at what it says here in 2 Chronicles. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words, scoffing at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his own people, until there was no remedy. God's greatest problem is not with the heathen. His greatest problem is with his own people who rebel against him and won't do what he says. This reminds me of another parable. This is in Luke chapter 20, verse 9 and 10. Yeshua begins to tell the people a parable. He says, a man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and then went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty handed. Wow. That's exactly if you remember Isaiah 5 is the parable of the vineyard where God said he planted Israel as a vineyard. And he took all this tender care, removing all the thorns, the thistles, the rocks. And he looked for it to bring forth grapes. But what happened? It brought forth wild grapes. And so God had to destroy his vineyard. And I think it's interesting that knowing Yeshua was an Israeli and he lived in Israel. And it talks about he goes into another country. Well, Yeshua left and now he's been going to all of the nations and uh, it's for a long while. And now the time has come. He's coming back to Israel and let's see how he's treated. Let's look at Psalms 78. This is verse 36 through 40. Look at this concerning God. They flattered him with their mouth. They lied to him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast toward him. They were not faithful to his covenant. And yet this is the most unbelievable thing in the Bible. What does it say? Yet God being compassionate atoned for their iniquity. He did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all of his wrath. He remembered they were only but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. But how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Can you imagine? We can grieve God. We can break his heart. We, too, too often we see God as some a mighty powerful computer or something with all this brain power. 
we don't see God as grieving from a broken heart. Uh, that's one of the things that totally uh, rocked my world and changed my life. When I saw how uh, in Noah's day, it, it talks about he saw that man's heart was only evil continually and it grieved him at his heart. Do you know the word grieve there implies difficulty in breathing. Think of a child who is just sobbing out of control and is gasping for breath. That's how our God felt at, uh, at man's evil. We need to realize you can break God's heart. That's just mind-blowing. I, you know, I used to think, well, God is so tough and uh, he's uh, so impersonal. Uh, how can we do that? No, guess what? Where do you think we get our heartbreak from? We were made in his image. Think of the greatest heartbreak you could have. Multiply that times a billion and that will give you some idea of God's heartbreak toward having to even judge his own kids because of their rebellion. <clears throat> Look at Revelation 15 too. I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. Wow, remember that sea of glass? We've talked about it before. And also those who have conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. There are going to be overcomers who have to be here on earth during this time to overcome the beast and its image and its number. You don't overcome by being snatched out. You only overcome by having to go through it. Okay, so here are these people that are overcomers. They're going to be standing at this sea of glass with harps of God in their hand. Matter of fact, look at verse 3 and 4 of Revelation 15. What are they singing? The song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. I think that doesn't mean they're singing two different songs. That means the song they're singing is both the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And what are they saying? Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and magnify your name? You alone are holy. All the nations are going to come and worship you because of all your righteous acts that have been revealed. Everything that God does, even his wrath, is done in righteousness. Here we see they're singing the song of Moses saying, just and true are your ways. Well, let's go back and look at the song of Moses. Deuteronomy 31 verse 30 and it says, Moses spoke all the words of the song until they were finished in the ears of all the assembly of Israel. Well, let's look at Deuteronomy 32 verse 3 and 4. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, his work is perfect for all of his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness without iniquity. Just and right is he. It's amazing. Even in spite of all the wrath, people are going to be yelling out, you're not fair. But no, everything that God does, he has held back his wrath for 6,000 years. And he wants to get it over with. It'll be poured out and done. But guess what? It'll be done in the right measure at the right time to the right people in the right way. And everyone will have to acknowledge that he is totally just. Matter of fact, look at Psalms 111 verse 2 through 4. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have delight the therein. His work is glory and majesty, and His righteousness endures forever. He has made a memorial for all of His wonderful works. The Lord is gracious, and the Lord is full of compassion. As a matter of fact, Hosea 14, 9. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. The ways of the Lord are right, and the just walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. So when you look at the Torah, the laws of God that are just and right, okay, what happens? Those who are righteous can walk in the Torah, but those who are unrighteous are the ones who stumble with the law. They say the law is done away with. Why? Because it causes them to stumble. Psalm 86, 9 through 11. All nations whom you have made are going to come 
and prostrate themselves before you, O Lord, and they will glorify your name. For you are great. You do wondrous things. You are God alone. And then it says, teach me, O Lord, your ways that I may walk in your truth. Make one my heart to fear your name. Wow. What a prayer we need to make. God, make my heart one with yours that I may fear your name. We're going to close again. Look at this from Isaiah 66, 23. It'll come to pass from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another. All flesh is going to come and worship before me, says the Lord. We need to get it in our mind. The Sabbath is not done away with. The new moons are not done away with. And if we want to walk uprighteously and not stumble in God's commands, but have a heart to be one with Him, to meet with Him at His appointed times, then we need to follow His calendar, not the Roman pagan calendar that the world uses. We need that calendar. We need the Roman pagan calendar because that's the world we live in. But guess what? We're in the world, but we're not of it. We use it for the worldly things, but we want to speak to God. We need to be on His calendar. With that said, uh, let's pray and uh, we can have uh, the prayer team come forward. Uh, and if you want prayer, come on up and have prayer. But let's, let's take a moment and pray. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for your Torah, for your word. And I pray, Lord, as we decode this book of Revelation and we see all the connections to the Torah and to Isaiah and to Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea, all these prophets, that, God, you would begin to put all of the little uh, puzzle pieces together, that we could have a clearer picture of what you're speaking to the church in these last days. And we thank you so much in Yeshua's name. Amen.